Hello, everyone. So in a moment, I'm going to talk to you about some cutting-edge molecular biology of corals. But before I do that, I would like to go back in time 72 years, back to the year uh, 1942. More than a decade before the helical structure of DNA was resolved, and in fact, even before the experiments of Avery and his colleagues conclusively proved that DNA is the support of genetic information. So in 1942, a Scottish developmental biologist, Conrad Weddington, had the visionary insight that regardless of the support of genetic information, if all cells share the same genetic information, there must be some mechanisms above and beyond genetics to explain the diversity of cell types that can be produced based on the same genome. And he coined the phrase epigenetics to uh, describe this type of regulation that enabled to pr produce several outputs based on the same genetic information. So now it has become evident that epigenetic regulations are not only important to create diversity at the cellular level, but they are also fundamental at the organismal level to enable complex life cycle and response of an organism to its environment. And we find that throughout the tree of life in various plants and animals. And so these epigenetic regulations are uh, induced often by uh, environmental cues. They are a link between genome and environment. And so epigenetic regulations are context-dependent interpretation of a genome. I like to call them conditional phenotypes. So this is particularly important in the context of coral reef because epigenetically driven phenotypic plasticity could help corals if anthropogenic, anthropogenic changes happen too fast for uh, genetic adaptation to occur. And in fact, a number of uh, studies recently have started to show that some corals in some conditions can adapt to changes such as increased temperature and um, ocean acidification. For instance, this recent paper two months ago by Steve Palombi's group published in Science. And of course, Phil Monday has done a lot of pioneering work uh, on uh, acclimation to CO2 in fish. So now, 72 years after uh, Waddington's theoretical insight, we know a lot more about the molecular mechanism of uh, epigenetic regulation. There are things like uh, histone modifications, micro, uh, small RNAs, and DNA methylation. So what I'm going to talk about today is DNA methylation, which is the addition of a methyl group onto cytosine uh, in the DNA, onto cytosine residues. So I'm going to focus on uh, DNA methylation as a mechanism of epigenetic regulation. And what I'm going to talk to you about is the basic DNA methylation landscape in the coral Acropora millepora, uh, and use that to get some evolutionary insight into the evolution of epigenetic regulation. The ultimate goal of uh, this work being to understand better the molecular mechanism underlying phenotypic plasticity and uh, acclimation. So the first thing to do, the first thing I did, was to look uh, in coral uh, genomes and transcriptomes to see if they have the molecular machinery, the enzyme necessary to methylate their DNA. And in fact, all Cnidarian have a classic uh, DNA methylation machinery with the two main enzymes required to methylate DNA, which are DNMT1, DNA methylase type 1, and DNMT3, DNA methylase type 3. DNA methylase type 3 is a DNA methylase that will create new methylation pattern on a strand of DNA while uh, DNA, DNMT1 is a maintenance methylase. So when DNA is methylated on one strand, it will turn it into a symmetrically methylated DNA. So despite the very conserved nature of this um, DNA methylation machinery in most animals, and even in fact outside animals, uh, we find some very big differences in the actual methylation patterns in these various species. Uh, 
So it goes from extremely high methylation patterns in species like us, uh, vertebrates, to no methylation at all in things like uh, Drosophila. And in some invertebrates, uh, like Apis, uh, the bee, we find a very low methylation pattern really restricted in some parts of the genome. So how does it look like in corals? So the first approach that I used to uh, ask this question is a purely bioinformatic approach. It doesn't require to make experiments, just require to look at the DNA sequence itself. And it's based on the fact that DNA methylation has a mutagenic effect on the, cyto on the methylated cytosine. Over evolutionary time, methylated cytosine tend to turn into uracil and then uh, thymine. And so therefore, methylation results in CPG underrepresentation. So we can calculate the propensity of a particular CPG dinucleotide to get uh, methylated over time simply by measuring the ratio of observed CPG dinucleotide divided by the expected numbers that we, the numbers that we would expect based on the number of Cs and Gs in a, in a genome. And so in a species with a very high methylation like us, we got a lot of this mutagenic effect of methylation and therefore a high depletion in uh, CPG dinucleotides. Whereas, as I said, in species missing methylation like the fly, the bias is just around one. So we have as many CPGs dinucleotide as we would expect. If we look in uh, Acropora millepora, what we find is something that looks like a, a mixture of two distributions. It's not exactly bimodal, but it's clearly a mixture of uh, two distributions, with one peak around one, which would correspond to genes that over time have a low propensity to get methylated, and a peak uh, much lower than one, corresponding to genes that have a high propensity to get methylated. Now, which genes are these genes that get methylated or that don't get methylated? To uh, answer this question, we developed a developmental atlas of uh, Acropora millepora, looking at methylation at differ uh, different uh, developmental stages. And uh, then using this simple uh, tissue specificity index, I looked at genes that are specific for a particular uh, developmental um, stage and genes that are ubiquitously expressed throughout the, the development. So you can see uh, this tissue developmental, uh, sorry, this tissue specificity index is equal to uh, one when a gene is expressed in only one condition and is equal to zero if a gene is equally expressed throughout all developmental stages. And looking at genes that are the two extremes of this tissue specificity index, we can see that the genes that tend to be methylated are genes that are expressed ubiquitously through development. Whereas genes specific to a given conditions uh, tend to be not methylated. So here we have methylation associated with gene expression and gene expression in a ubiquitous manner throughout development. So this contrasts significantly with the dogma uh, in vertebrates where DNA methylation is often thought of as being associated with uh, silencing of genes by methylation of promoters or X chromosome inactivation and silencing of transposome. So here the situation is somewhat uh, different. But these are, of course, just uh, bioinformatic predictions based on uh, the composition, the CPG composition of the genome. So now to experimentally verify this prediction, I uh, looked at a single base resolution which cytosines in the coral genome are actually methylated. And the assay that we use to do that is called uh, whole genome bisulfite sequencing. So we treat uh, DNA with sodium bisulfite, and this will transform all the Cs into Ts, except the ones uh, that are methylated. So we know that the Cs that remain Cs are the ones that are methylated, whereas the ones that are turned into Ts were not methylated. So we convert the DNA of the whole genome, sequence it, and map it to the genome. So the first challenge here is that we are not working with DNA made of four letters anymore, but to allow mapping, we have to work in a DNA made of only three letters, because uh, to allow mapping, we have to uh, um, 
transform all the C's into, into T's. So that's the first uh, challenge. The second challenge comes from the coral itself and for the very high level of polymorphism that we find in most coral species. So if you take two random uh, human beings, you will find that in average it will be 99.9% uh, identical at the DNA level if you ignore the uh, sex chromosome, of course. If you take us and our closest relative, uh, we are more or less 99% identical in our DNA. If you, take two Acropora, if you take one Acropora colony and compare the genotype from the mother to the genotype from the father within the, within the same cell, we have at least 3% divergence between these two, uh, these two haplotypes. So we have a massive difference uh, compared to what is found in uh, most other species. And that's a common theme in the uh, handful of coral genomes that have been sequenced to date. So once we've overcome this problem of uh, mapping in three-letter space on a very uh, polymorphic genome, we can start asking specific questions about the DNA methylation landscape of corals. So first of all, which bases uh, which cytosines are actually methylated. So we looked um, in different uh, conditions. So you can see the different columns correspond to different um, developmental stages or tissues, so planula, prawn chip, sperm. And the different rows correspond uh, to cytosines in different contexts. H meaning uh, anything except, uh, except a G. So CHG is C, any letter except a G, and then a G. CHH is C followed by two letters, uh, which are not Gs. And finally, CPGs, the canonical dinucleotide, which is usually methylated in animal. And what we can find is uh, here, so very low proportion of methylation in CHH and CHG uh, uh, context. So these are just a uh, spurious artifact of incomplete bisulfite conversion. So true methylation in coral really happens only in the CPG um, context, which validate our original uh, bioinformatic approach to look at CPG, uh, CPG dinucleotide depletion. So we can then ask, uh, where are the CPG dinucleotides that are methylated? Where in the genome do we find them? So rough, this is more or less where we find them. So this is a CPG methylation level in different parts of, um, of uh, coral genome. So compared to, this is the start of a gene, the body of a gene, and the end of a gene. So you can see there's a background methylation level of about 15% and a clear increase in the gene body of corals. Now, if we zoom a little bit closer inside the gene body, sorry, before I do that, uh, yeah, so this type of uh, high methylation level in uh, the gene body compared to the background methylation level in the rest of the genome is uh, reminiscent of what has been observed in other invertebrates like bees or Siona. But we don't have the very high methylation level found in vertebrates, and we don't have this uh, clear decrease of methylation around the promoter regions found in plants or, or vertebrates. Now, if we zoom a little bit closer inside genes and look at what happens uh, in introns and exons, we find a drop in the methylation level around the intron exon boundaries, which tend to suggest that methylation should, uh, probably plays some role in the regulation of alternative splicing, which is what we have discovered as well in other invertebrates. And also which makes sense because we don't have here a function of methylation, just turning off genes. It's a more subtle regulation of ubiquitously expressed genes. So it's a more qualitative regulation of genes, so producing different uh, splice variants rather than just turning it on and off. And so here you see a slight drop around the um, donor site and a slight drop around the acceptor site. In repeats, in transposon, basically, we also see uh, 
um, slight increase of, uh, of methylation level. So this is what we find in corals, but we can also, uh, and this is summarized here in uh, Acroporami lepora, but we find also very similar um, methylation, um, uh, methylation landscape in another, if we look at another uh, distantly related Cnidarian, uh, the freshwater polyp uh, Hydra. Qualitatively, the methylation levels are very similar. Um, however, there are some quantitative difference in the actual level. So here you see the background in corals around 15% and peaks at about 25% in um, gene bodies or in um, transposons, whereas in Hydra, it peaks about, about double, around 50% in gene bodies and, uh, and transposons which is probably driven by the amount of uh, transposons that you have in, uh, in these two species. There is probably double the amount of transposon in Hydra compared to a typical uh, coral genome, which probably drives an increase in the amount of uh, DNA methylation found in these in this, uh, two Cnidarian species. So we can then ask, now knowing that methylation primarily targets the gene bodies of genes in the, in the corals, what is the evolutionary history of these methylated genes? And to do that, I compared the methylation status of um, uh, genes in uh, these two distantly related Cnidarian species. And so we can find, if you look here along a line, that first of all, methylated genes then are more conserved, so you have more, a higher number of homologs from methylated genes to methylated genes that you have from non-methylated genes to non-methylated genes. But also, methylated genes in one species tend also to be methylated in the other species. So broadly speaking, over the very long evolutionary periods that separate Acropora and Hydra, the targets of gene body methylation have remained the same. Even if we, look over, if we look over even more uh, distant evolutionary uh, histories, comparing uh, coral to, um, to an insect, for instance, we also find a higher propensity for um, methylated genes to find an homologue in insect. And similarly, uh, the status of these genes remain the same over this very long uh, evolutionary period. Now, if we look at it from another perspective, not just looking at homologs between two species, but looking at at which point of time did this methylated gene originate, we can look at it using this so-called genomic uh, phylostratigraphy technique, which was uh, pioneered by uh, Tomislav Domaseloso. Um, you can see here a phylogenetic tree with uh, different strata at each node of the tree, and you can see at each of the stratum the log odds of a gene emerging, uh, of a methylated gene emerging in that stratum. And you can see that most of the methylated gene appeared in these two stratum. So around the time of uh, emergence of eukaryotes and during the diversification of, uh, of metazoa. So these are ancient genes that were critical to setting up eukaryotic cells and in the um, diversification of, uh, of metazoa. So we have this, we know where methylation occurs, we know the evolutionary history of these genes, so what is their function? So to make a long story short, I will uh, summarize it on, on this slide. So the methylated genes are involved in fundamental signaling pathways like MAP kinase or IP3 kinase. They play major roles in basal information processing machinery like basal transcription factors and spliceosome. And they are involved in a central metabolic network like Krebs cycle, amino acid biosynthesis, and so on. So in summary, corals have a mostly typical invertebrate uh, CPG methylation landscape, even if this landscape changes quantitatively a bit between species. Uh, so we have methylation in intron, exon, and transposons. So despite a wide difference in the methylation level amongst animals, the targets of gene body methylation are broadly conserved. And so DNA methylation 
uh, fine-tune the expression level of conserved housekeeping genes involved in signaling, information processing, and uh, metabolism. And so now, um, what is very interesting now is we can now move on to understand what is the role of this gene in regulating phenotypic plasticity uh, in corals, what role it could play in acclimation, and how does it differ between species. So thank you uh, for your attention, and I'd like to thank all these people who've uh, played various roles in uh, that study.